This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks, good evening. So we're in Chapter 8, the Articular System. Um, so we're going to be talking about joints, the articulations within the body. And we will be looking at, in addition to this PowerPoint, <clears throat> we will be reviewing uh, the note packet that I have for you all that I'm going to show you at, at the end of this uh, PowerPoint, and I will share with you uh, at the end of the class. Okay, so let's uh, let's dig in. Let's go into it here. So an articulation. This is a union between two or more bones, and what's going to happen there is that we're going to have two bones not actually rubbing on each other as far as bone upon bone, but there'll be some type of cartilage present there. And more times than not, it will be hyaline cartilage, right? Remember that hyaline cartilage is the type of cartilage that is the uh, the, the um, framework upon which the skeletal system uh, ossifies the cartilage and becomes bone, okay, for in the fetus. And so we're going to be talking about uh, the articulations here. Uh, some can be mobile, some can be Im or immobile, right? And so like when we think of the, the sutures in your skull, right? That's a situation where you know, we're not having movement there. And, and if there is movement there, there shouldn't really be movement there. And it's a very dangerous thing if people are, you know, kind of working the suture joints and such. I don't recommend that or think that's a wise thing, okay? My professional opinion. Uh, so let's let's move on here. So classifications, we classify them by a structure and function, okay? So there's three groups that it's based upon as far as the joints are classified. So uh, function, how the movement that's taking place, or structure, the material that's holding the bones together, okay? So structure and function, very important. So we have here, right, the, the uh, synarthroses, right? So synarthrosis, singular, synarthroses, plural, okay? So synarthrosis, throses, amphiarthroses, and diarthroses, S-A-D, SAD. Okay, so it's kind of come to you quickly there. So synarthroses, right? So no movement. So suture joints. So the syndesmosis as far as between the radius and the ulna, okay, connection of that. And we'll show uh, images and such of this. But it's that very uh, thin uh, connective tissue between uh, the two bones, the two long bones there, and a gomphosis. So the teeth in your sockets, right, those alveolar processes within the mandible and the maxilla, um, there should not be movement going on, right? The only type of movement that, that could take place as far as if you have uh, braces, and we know that that's quite an arduous process and can be painful at times, trying to movement of the uh, the teeth into a better alignment. Um, also, you can have, uh, you can wear, um, oh, what is it called? <laughs> Somebody, does anybody wear one at night um, where you're just, I forget the term, what is it called? A retainer. Yeah. A retainer. Retainer, thank you. Hey, thanks, who was that? What, Norma and who else? Nina. Yeah, Nina. Oh, good job, guys. Thank you. The retainers, right? These are just ways also that, you know, even after, you're, after you've had braces put in, you know, um, the teeth can go back. So you need to wear that retainer in order to maintain the alignment, right? Um, so these are areas where, you know, there shouldn't be any movement taking place, really, okay? As far as the amphiarthrosis, so we start with sin, we go to amphi, and then we go to di. All right, so amphiarthrosis, there's going to be slight movement. So the pubic symphysis joint, yes, there can be slight movement there. Uh, recall that at the pubic symphysis, we have fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage, a very tough, durable cartilage. How about here? The synchondrosis, the uh, connected by hyaline cartilage, um, the growth plate between the diaphysis and the epiphyses, right? So that growth plate, that epiphyseal plate, that's a synchondrosis. Now know that that area there only present for, for a period of time from childhood up until puberty, right? So after puberty and we stop growing, then that's going to be the hyaline cartilage there of the epiphyseal plate, aka the growth plate, will be re replaced with bone. That'll become ossified and you'll just have an epiphyseal plate. You'll just see a line there. You won't because it's all ossified. It's not, no longer will be cartilage. So these two areas, these can be an example of an amphiarthrosis, slight movement, okay? And then we have the freely moving uh, joints there, the diarthrodial. That's another term that's used, diarthrodial. And you're going to see, I believe that I have that in the notes there. If not, I'll, I'll remind you of it. So the diarthroses or diarthrosis, singular. Um, these are, uh, we can, there's also, they are synovial joints are the joints that are hollow joints that contain fluid within and allow for free movement. Okay. So we'll be looking at that in uh, more detail. Okay. And so 
Think of, think of like an elbow joint, think of the knee, think of the shoulder, think of the hips, right? The ball and socket of the uh, femoral head in the acetabulum, diarthrodial joint. So here we go with a basic example of a synovial joint, okay? Which is the diarthrodial joint, a diarthrosis, a uh, freely movable joint. And what we'd like here, and what I want you, you will need to memorize this, okay? And I know, like we're saying, memorize it, what do you mean? Well, you should be able to copy this image and draw it yourself from memory. From memory, you'll need to do this, okay? So from memory, you'll need to be able to draw this basic synovial joint. And so what does it entail? Well, first it entails the matter of that you're gonna be drawing two bones. There'll be articular cartilage on both the ends of the bone. Makes sense, right? Because we're not gonna have bone rubbing on bone. So that articular cartilage, will be hyaline cartilage, okay? Then you're going to draw a situation where we have this kind of a thing, right? Where you draw, and you don't have to draw here because this or this, but pretty much like from here to here and here to here, the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane will produce the synovial fluid that is present within that uh, synovial joint. So that joint is a hollow joint filled with fluid. It's a hollow fluid filled joint. And that's that synovial fluid produced by that synovial membrane. Okay. Then what you're going to see here is that you're going to have here uh, the draw, you can draw just on one side, you don't have to draw on both sides, the fibrous cartilage, fibrous cartilage. Okay. This is all a part of this whole synovial joint. So you'd have fibrous cartilage over here also. Okay. And so it would be this, this capsule. So you have the synovial fluid of the joint, the synovial membrane, the fibrous capsule, this is really the synovial joint, okay? It's got two multiple layers to it, okay? And then you're gonna see here that, what is the outer covering of bone? A periosteum, periosteum. What would be the inner covering of the bone in the medullary cavity, right? This is the medullary cavity. This is the epiphyses of the bone, okay? Medullary cavity is gonna contain what? Marrow, right? But it's lined with, end ostium, end ostium. So end ostium here, periosteum on the outside, and here you've got your basic synovial joint, okay? So this could be a digit, to be honest, right? This would be an easy, so you could see one of the phalanges at one of the, one of the joints here. So we have here proximal, middle, distal phalanx. So e either here or here, as far as those joints, that would be an example of a uh, synovial joint, okay? All right. Um, also, if you folks are having issues with uh, with your internet and such, I highly recommend, and I do this myself, is that I have my uh, my laptop is directly plugged into my router via a a cord. Um, what do they call this cord? The Ethernet cord, right? An Ethernet cord. Um, so this way, there's not an issue as far as with connectivity because sometimes Wi-Fi can be dicey, and even in a house that's busy with m multiple people. You know, your Wi-Fi can be affected and such. So having it directly connected via an Ethernet cable, very important and very helpful. I, I see sometimes uh, folks are coming in and out of the class, unfortunately, and I feel bad for you because uh, that's that's hard. But again, to know that I, ha I do have this, I have these recordings up and posted on my YouTube channel. Okay, so let's move on. So again, too, you need to know, you'll need to draw this from memory. Please just know that, okay? Could that even be part of a quiz in lab? Yeah, that might, that could be. The movements that are present, right? So we said as far as, uh, so let's go back for a moment here. So here we have function and structure, okay? So the degree of movement we talked about, um, synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, diarthrosis, right? Degree of movement, function. Now we're gonna be looking at structure. And here's the movements that'll take place. So we'll also we'll, we'll talk about the, the structure in just a moment here. First, we're going to go into what's called the range of motion. The range of motion, the ability for your parts of your body to move in certain directions. Now, you probably are all familiar with these terms, but we looked at them last week. Do you recall that in the chapter? So in, at the end of chapter seven, there's information regarding movement, okay? And uh, we're going to be also uh, discussing this and looking at this. And you can look at this also in um, uh, Fong and 
Scott and Fong's text also, right? So flexion and extension. So if we're doing cervical flexion and extension, we're doing cervical flexion, extension, flexion, extension, okay? Hyperextension, we're going even as far back as we possibly can force it to. So a, a hyperextension, abnormal extension. Uh, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. This would be, uh, you would see this uh, in your uh, the feet, okay? Um, how about, you know, it's not there yet, but supination and pronation supinate your hand pronate your hand supination pronation how about laying on your back would be what would be laying in the supine position laying on your stomach would be the prone position okay right. abduction and adduction so abduction a deduction a b duction a deduction so it's a matter of abduct would be to move remove from center Right, remove away from the area, like so the midline of the body, moving away from the midline would be abduction. If I abduct, Dr. go ahead. Dr. Perron, can you show me that once again, AB deduction? Yeah, sure. So look, so we're, we're at a deduction right now. A B deduction, abduct, a duct, a deduction. Thank you. A B deduction, a deduction, okay? Rotation, so look at cervical rotation, cervical rotation rotation of the cervical spine. And know that primarily rotation of the cervical spine, occiput C1, C2. So occiput, the the, connect, the the articulations between occiput, C1, atlas, C2, axis, that's where primarily you get most of this rotation. And then a little bit, the latter part of the rotation is going to then incorporate some more of the uh, cervical vertebrae. Okay? Um, and really C, C2, the dens going into the circular bone, the oval bone, the um, at, atlas, C1 uh, really allows for this uh, pivoting taking place. Uh, so that's for rotation and circumduction. So think as far as like a very complex movement within the shoulder and the hip, okay? I talked about supination, pronation. Eversion and inversion, we're looking at as far as the, the foot is concerned. Protraction and retraction would be like your jaw, being able to protract and then retract. And opposition and reposition, um, you know, like look at your your thumb, your opposable thumb, right? That would be opposition and reposition. So here we have, as far as the diarthrodial joints, the synovial joints, freely movable joints, okay? So the ball and socket joint. So think your shoulder, think your hip, right? The 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 femoral head and the acetabulum. Think that as far as for the ball and socket. Now, as far as the uh, the shoulder is concerned, right, the um, the head of the humerus uh, articulates into the uh, glenoid cavity, aka the glenoid fossa. It's not very deep, is it not, right? So we have what's called the labrum. So there's soft tissue present there that helps to deepen the socket for the uh, glenoid fossa, aka the glenoid cavity. Uh, widest range of movement. Movement can occur in all planes and directions, okay? And that circumduction is what can take place in a ball and socket type joint, okay? So there we go, and looking at, uh, we're, we're looking at the head of the femur in the acetabulum, okay? A hinge type joint. So the knee and elbow, you would think of a hinge, right? So we think of this, this action of a hinge, right? Flexion and, and extension only. Okay. You can hyperflex, hyperextend your your elbow, right? But that would create a, a problem there, and that could damage soft tissue as well as the hard tissue. If you do it hard enough, right? Um, that would be a hinge joint. And here we're looking at the hinge. Okay. And what we're looking at, right, is the trochlea and the trochlear notch. Right. That that ability for uh, in the ulna. In the ulna, we see that. Uh, trochlear notch, that U shape. That's one other way that we can determine. Hey, that's the uh, that's the ulna. The pivot. So think of uh, the pivot as far as the atlas and the axis, right? So the dens, the dens in atlas, right? That articulation would be a pivot. How about also um, the radial head, the radial head of the radius and ulna? That articulation is also the soft tissue will go around the radial head anchoring it to uh, the ulna and that would be also a pivot type joint rotation in one plane 
Okay, a condyloid joint. Condyloid joint. So we're thinking uh, the radius and the cul and the carpal bones. So remember the carpal bones are your wrist bones. The radius is the bone that is on the side of your thumb, right? Uh, phalange number one. And so move, motion in uh, two planes at right angles to each other. So it's kind of an uh, interesting type of a, of a joint there. So see how you're seeing here as far as, so here we have, we're looking at, so this is, so, so this would be, this would be left hand, left hand, left hand, because you're looking at it from, and see, you'll see here, so pisiform, trichetrum, lunate, scaphoid, okay, and so pisiform, so it's left hand, so pisiform is on the side of what? Number five finger, so here we have number five, number five, and here's number one, that's the thumb, right? So we're going to have, uh, well, it's going to be the metacarpal, which will then extend to metacarpal number one, which will extend to thumb, right? Uh, the uh, proximal and distal phalanx. So these are carpals, metacarpals, but the numbering corresponds with the phalanges, right? So, and so that we have one, two, three, four, and five metacarpals corresponding with the five phalanges. A saddle joint, right? So a saddle joint, you think what's going on as far as opposition takes place with the thumb. And you'll see that right here as far as, so we have here proximal and distal phalanx. Here's what? Metacarpal number one. So then here we would have, and so let's go back for a moment here. So we're, what are we looking at here? So if it's pisiform, trichetrum, lunate, scaphoid, so then what we have here, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, trapezium. So it's the trapezium and the metacarpal number one. Gliding motion. So think your intervertebral joints. So the facet joints, recall this, I've mentioned this as far as the superior and inferior articulating facets. These are going to have this ability uh, to have this gliding type of motion, right? And even between the, the the actual, so here would be also um, the intervertebral discs made of fibrocartilage, right? And so we have here the, the vertebral bodies. What would this represent? That's the spinous processes, okay? The spinous process. So that piece of the vertebra that is right in the centrally located, and you can actually palpate your spinous processes. So that's also a, a part of the body that you can actually touch and feel the spinous processes of the vertebra, okay? But so gliding action, not a whole lot of movement, but there's some movement that, take, that takes place. This term here, I'm sure that very much that you've all heard of this term. Now, I'm going to stop for a moment and I'm going to minimize this. I'm going to come back to the classroom, stop sharing, and I'd like to just ask you all if you have any questions. Does anybody have any questions so far? I, I've provided, I will provide this note packet, um, and I think you're going to really appreciate how I've put it together as far as with some pathologies. That'll be very helpful to you all. So not only just looking at images on your PowerPoint, but looking in the text and looking on Google and just like getting a, a full rounded um, uh, information regarding the articulations. Urus, do you have a question? Yes, sir. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Yes. I hope your daughter gets well soon. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So my question was, I know about hypoextension. You said it, it will be an abnormal extension, but can you please explain about supination and pronation and aversion sure. and inversions? Yeah. I didn't get that part. Thank you. That's okay. Let's see how I'm going to do it here. Okay, here we go. That's I kind of hard. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> all right, here we go. So my hand is palm up, palmer surface up. When I go this direction, palmer surface down, that is pronation. When I do it this way, it's supination, palmer surface up, right? Pronation, supination. There we go. Pronation, supination. Okay. <laughs> and the next one, eversion and inversion? Yeah, so I'm gonna have to show you that. You'd have to look that up on, in in YouTube and such because I don't have like a good image for that. But you you can see it, and particularly you're thinking of your foot, okay? okay. So as far as dorsiflexion, pro, 
dorsiflexion and uh, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion, you'll look at the, the uh, lower extremity and that'll be able to give you an idea. You'll see that on, uh, and you can look that up on YouTube. Indeed, and okay. that's very and even for protection, uh, for retraction and protection also? Yeah, think think of your jaw. So okay. your jaw, if I, I, I have issues with my TMJ, so I'm just gonna tell you. So <laughs> if I were, to, <laughs> it's all getting old folks, so let me tell you. But uh, <laughs> if you were to allow your jaw, you, you know, so your mandible to go forward a bit, so you would have like where you could protract and retract, bring it back in. So if you turn it out and in, kind of that's, I know that's weird, right? Protraction, retraction, the jaw, that would be one way to, to look at that type of a movement. So but again, we don't move our jaw. Changes of motion. Go ahead. So, but we don't move our jaw outside, do we? No. It's only, do we do that? Protection, do we do that in normal life? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can a little bit, you know, don't depend. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, it's kind of a weird thing, but it, it's just, if we're defining any type of motion, then you should know all the different types of motion that are possible for the human body. Understood? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And, uh... That's good. Yes. Uh, no. So one second. So you said something. I hope I'm pronouncing it correct for uh, condyloid, right? For radius and carpal bones. Can you please explain that you were saying? Explaining something is just for the for the articulation with the carpals with metacarpals and fillings. That's the only thing, right? Yeah. So it's just a matter. Of, so let me let me then share with my screen with you again. Yeah. So you're looking at the radius and the carpal bones, right? And, and so this would be, let me come here and just show you that. So see what's going on here. So here's the radius, right? Here's the uh, number one metacarpal, right? Here's the carpals, metacarpals, right? So this area right here. So do you see how it's kind of an interesting articulation? So really understand that, you know, you're gonna get some kind of weird, weird movements and such that you can, your, your wrist has quite a bit of ability to move, right? And so part of that is as a result of the articulations between the radius and the carpal joint, carpal bones, as well as the ulna and the carpal bones, and the articu the strange articulation really that's really between each of the carpal bones and of the metacarpals. So it's just kind of a an area where we can have limited type movement, right? Um, but it's it's a type of movement, so that's why we we, we classify it as condyloid. And you you might even hear this term, and you see this term in papers and stuff. Ellipsoidal, right? Okay. So you said it motion in two planes at right angles. How is that so? Is it just the? Yeah. So so think about this because can it can it move in this direction as well as in this direction? So look at mm -hmm. here, okay? and as well as. But it's not a lot of movement. See, because I'm moving more than just this area right here, but just at this area where we have, um, where you have the metacarpal and the uh, carpals moving and such, yeah, there's a little bit of a movement in two planes of of movement, that's, that's it, okay? Then you have other areas of movement throughout that are allowing for other flexion and extension as far as at the areas of the um, metacarpals and the phalanges and as a result of also um, the radius and ulna and the carpals. I don't know how it's explaining to you. Yeah, let, but let me just show you and give you the note packet too, and that'll kind of give you some more example and such also, okay? Thank you. You're welcome, okay? All right, so let's finish up the PowerPoint. There's only a few more slides to go, and then I'd like to, so I'm gonna start with the bursa here. There's only a couple of slides, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and review the uh, note packet that I'm going to uh, provide for you all. Actually, before I take, once I'm done giving you the PowerPoint, I'm going to stop what I'm doing, go to uh, documents and resources. I'm gonna post the note packet for you, and then we'll come back after a break, and then we'll review the note packet together. It's about three pages. Okay, so let's take a look here as far as the bursa. So when we think bursa, you, you might might have heard the term bursitis, the inflammation of this structure here, the bursa. 
So the bursa, these are closed sacs. These are sacs that actually have uh, fluid within, okay? So there's synovial membrane lining. So there's going to be some synovial fluid present within, and they are in areas where um, preventing friction between tissues, okay? So aiding in the movement of joints. So a common bursa that you'll hear would be uh, the subacromial bursa. So right here, subacromial, recall, right? We have the acromion process of the uh, scapula that's going to have the articulation between what? The, the AC joint, the, the clavicle, the acromioclavicular joint. So in that area here, the subacromial bursa, that can be a bursa that gets inflamed, irritated, and can be quite painful. We can also have a bursa that is here in the olecranal region, okay? Olecranon process of the, um, of the ulna. And that bursa right there in this area can get inflamed and enlarged, and it can look very strange. Has anybody ever seen uh, that kind of a situation there where the elbow looks swollen and kind of puffy and such? And that's as a result of excess fluid and tissue in that, in that bursa there from inflammation. So let's take a look and see. So you'll see here as far as, um, so it can be subcutaneous between skin and underlying bony processes, subfascial between overlying muscles, subtendinous between uh, the tendons and bony projection. So it's really, there are numerous areas of the body where these bursa can be present. And if they get inflamed and irritated, we call it bursitis. All right, good. All right, folks. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to go to our classroom. Now, so I'm going to tell you this, folks, that I would request, you can start taking your break now, and we'll start at 5.30. So we'll come back. We'll be starting the, the, the note packet at 5.30. You're going to give me a few minutes to be able to post the, in documents and resources, I'm going to be posting your articulations notes, okay? So I'll post them in Unit two, yeah, and unit two is where I'll post these, where, where I posted the chapter eight. I'm gonna also post the uh, the note, yeah, there we go, chat. All right, so if you wanna take a break for a few minutes there and come back and we'll start class at 
start in a few minutes, folks. Okay, students, so we just a couple minutes to go there. I hope everybody is uh, okay and at, the, at your, uh, at your um, stations as far as with your computers and such. So I'm going to start by, I want to go over a few of the uh, different motions. You're not going to be able to hear any type of um, actual audio because you're listening to me right now, but I'm going to show you a couple of uh, uh, short video that you can just watch and see the actions as far as so with the protraction and retraction, as far as eversion and inversion, and also uh, with, um, well, I'll show you supination pronation because he wasn't able to really see it there good. And I'll also show you dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Okay, so let me just come back to everybody here. Stop sharing for just one moment. Show everyone, um, are we okay? Is everybody on board? Are we okay? I'm gonna show you a couple of videos first and then we'll get into the note packet. All good, any problems? All right, very good. Okay, so let's, hi to everyone. I'm going to now share my screen 
we're looking on YouTube. So here we have an issue of where an example of protraction and retraction. So watch what goes on with the mandible. Let's do that again. Protraction, retraction. Protraction, see how it goes anteriorly a bit, and then retraction, going back to the set point area there, the, the starting position. So now let's also look at as far as Here. Okay, let's go to E version. Inversion of the foot. Right. So you're not you're not hearing what he's saying right at the moment, but let's just go over, let's see. Here, here, this is, okay, here we go. All right, so let's let's take a look and see as far as looking at his foot there. So inversion, you'll be going towards the midline, okay? So watch what he does. He just did it there in the beginning. Let's take a look at his foot from the, so that's inversion, that's eversion. So inversion going towards the midline. E version moving the foot away from the midline. Let's there's inversion, there's E version. Do that again. There's inversion, there's E version. Okay. So either we're going towards the midline or we're going towards uh, the lateral. So the medial or lateral movement of the dorsum of the foot. Okay. Then let's look at supination pronation and you can do this also folks right so this is important for you as you're doing your studies here we go so the hand is in the supine supinated position supinated pronated supinated pronated supinated and pronated very good okay now dorsiflexion and plantar flexion dr perone sorry yes, i wanted i wanted to ask this before um for yeah, the supination um yes. could you look at it as like the way your hand is being in the like a supine to make you remember it like a supine yeah, position and that, yeah indeed and that's how i would look at it I'm laying supine, I'm laying on my back in the supine position. And really, when I'm in the anatomical position, what's going on? I'm, I'm, my palms are facing anteriorward, are they not, right? Yes. So, yeah, so let's, let's look at that real quick there. Right, so when we're looking at the anatomical position, So we're looking at, right? So this patient, right? We're looking at either the anterior, and this is in the anatomical position. Here's the anatomical position with this gentleman, and we're looking at the lateral view, right? But here we are in the, the anterior view, and we're looking at the patient with the palms facing anteriorward, okay? So, and so again, if you're laying on your back, you're laying face up, and so you would, I think of it also as I'm in a supine position. If I'm laying on my stomach, I'm in the prone position. So very good, okay. good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. You're welcome. You're welcome. So let's look at, um, here we go. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. The dorsum of your foot is the anterior top port of your foot. The plantar area of your foot is the sole of your foot. Okay. So. So here we go, dorsiflexion, dorsi, it, we, we would say dorsi extension, dorsi extension, dorsiflexion, it's going towards the dorsum, 
plantar flexion, you're going towards the sole of your foot, right? Uh, if I have, if I'm suffering with plantar fasciitis, it's going to be the sole of my foot that there's going to be inflammation and tightening of the soft tissue, right? On the plantar. So that would be plantar fasciitis. Have you ever heard of that? It, it can lead to um, heel spurs, right? If you've been standing for long periods of time, um, which many of you probably are doing right now or will be doing in your profession, you're going to have, you could have issues with uh, heel spurs, with uh, plantar fasciitis. And uh, yeah, it's uh, to be tough stuff. So you have to, yes, very painful. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, it's very painful. That's correct. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. Okay. So let's minimize that and let's go to. So this is the packet that I'm I uh, posted for you all now. It's in documents and resources. Okay. And so I think we have. Let's see how many pages. One, two. I think it's three pages, right? Three, oh, okay. Four pages, sorry about that, four pages total. All right, so we're seeing here as far as, so we know, let me let me go to the uh, next page for a moment here. Or no, the first uh, bottom of the first page. So here we're seeing that the functional classification as far as SAD, synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, diarthrosis, we can also say, Diarthrodial. That's a that that's also a term that you might see come up. The term diarthrodial. It just means a freely movable joint. Okay, a diarthrosis. Diarthroses. SES is plural. SIS singular. Okay. So that's the functional classification as far as immovable, slightly movable, freely movable. We get that SAD. Okay. But now let's go to the structural classification. So. We're going to see that with these joints right here, these fibrous joints are what? They are synarthroses, right? Plural. They're immovable joints. So a fibrous joint is also a synarthrosis, right? Because we're not going to have really a movement taking place here. A little bit in a symdesmosis can take place here, but the suture, the gomphosis, no movement really should be taking place there. There can be a little movement because know this folks that with your pronation and supination the pronation and the supination that can also take place let me let me show you this i want to show you that image give me a moment That's a good one. There we go. So you see this inner osseous membrane? This inner osseous membrane between the radius and the ulna, right? Now remember, this would be a pivot joint right here, right? The radial head and these angular ligaments connecting it to the ulna, right? There we have the uh, coronoid process. Here we have the trochlear notch. Posterior to this trochlear notch will be the uh, your elbow there, the olecranon process. So this area right here, though, this interosseous membrane, that is a syndesmosis, okay? So it's going to provide a little bit of some movement, allowing for the pronation and the supination, okay? So, but other than that, though, folks, really, um, fibrous joints are not moving. So suture joint, gomphosis, synarthrosis. So the, the syndesmosis would really be more of like a slightly movable amphiarthrosis, okay? Slightly movable. Now, cartilaginous joints, so these are actually fibrous joints, so dense fibrous connective tissue is holding the joint together, okay? Cartilaginous joints, knowing that it's held together by cartilage. So we're looking at, so the symphysis, pubic symphysis, would be what? This would be a amphiarthrosis, and we saw an example when we looked at the, in your PowerPoint, the amphiarthrosis, a slightly movable joint, we're thinking the symphysis joint, fibrocartilage. So cartilaginous joints held together by cartilage, fibrocartilage at the symphysis, the pubic symphysis region, and then also uh, intervertebral joints. So there, there's also where we think of um, the uh, actual, the discs and such, 
that could be also considered uh, the intervertebral discs can be considered a symphysis joint. Okay, uh, not a lot of movement really in the, this, the that area there. Um, really, um, and that's why really when I was thinking in, in the PowerPoints, that's really um, I think of a facet joint when I think of like a little bit of a gliding motion and such, but not a whole lot of movement. And that would be right here as far as with the um, yeah, the plane joint, the right here, as far as non-axial movement, the gliding, this plane joint here would be considered and uh, the intervertebral uh, facet joints. So let's come back here for cartilaginous, okay? So synchondrosis, we think the epiphyseal plates, okay? For the period of time when there is growth taking place, right? That growth plate, that would be considered a cartilaginous joint, it's hyaline cartilage, and it would be an amphiarthrosis. So the synovial joints are all considered diarthroidal or diarthroses, right? So the plane, the hinge, the pivot, the condyloid. So the condyloid here, I didn't have it on the other, in the PowerPoint, but know that there's two movements, right? There's flexion extension as well as AB and AD duction. That's really what's taking place and what can, can occur at this area there, okay? Saddle joint, think of your thumb, and the ball and socket, think your shoulder, think your hip, okay? Now, we've discussed this, so I wanna move on and go to now uh, the next uh, couple of uh, pages here in the notes. And we're looking at here as far as uh, features of the synovial joint. So we went over the, the synovial joint. We talked about the structure. You will have to practice writing that and knowing that from memory, okay? Remembering as far as the fibrous capsule, as far as the synovial membrane, a synovial joint has a synovial fluid, which is produced by that synovial membrane. You have the two joints coming together. Think that those joints are going to have articulating cartilage, which would be hyaline cartilage, on the ends of both bones, so that bone is not rubbing on bone. And that, again, there's a fluid-filled, hollow, fluid-filled joint, synovial joint. The bursa, and also this, this um, structure called the tendon sheath. It's an elongated, so it's very similar to the bursa as far as it's got fluid present within this structure. And this elongated bursa, this fluid-filled structure, will wrap completely around tendons subjected to friction, okay? So this would be a tendinous sheath. Now we're gonna be talking about origin and insertion next chapter. when we're talking about the skeletal, when we're talking about muscle and skeletal muscle in particular. And so these terms here you should know, and I've given them to you early, as far as the origin is the attachment area of attachment. Let me get in those. Yeah, I've, so Angela, I've posted these notes now during the break. I posted them in documents and resources. Um, they should be in unit two, okay? Let's just, uh, you know, let's just take a moment. I'll check that for you all. Let's see. Yeah, so if you'll see, unit unit two in documents and resources and articulation notes, okay? Very good, so that's that's posted for you all. Very welcome, you're welcome, Angela, no problem, okay? So here you're looking at as far as uh, an explanation of then origin insertion. Origin would be the attachment of the muscle via a tendon to the immovable bone, the mo bone that's not gonna be moving, the anchor, and then the insertion would be then the muscular tendinous attachment to a bone that's gonna actually, when contraction takes place, it's going to move, okay? So muscle contraction causes the insertion to move toward the origin. Movements occur along transverse frontal and sagittal planes. And you know those planes. And you'll see here, as far as the uh, terms and listing of the uh, range of motion terms and what, what does it mean by non-axial, uniaxial, biaxial, multiaxial, Think movement in all in or around all three planes. So your shoulder joint, the um, ball and socket joint, will have this movement in all three planes, multi-axial, right? And we've talked about these different movements, but I've just given you some more information. I wanna get to now the uh, illnesses and injuries that can occur and pathology that can take place as far as in articulations, right? So we have, uh, tears, okay, so cartilage tears. Cartilage tears are very slow to repair because why? Because there is no blood supply. They're avascular, 
right? So as a result of a, you know, the blood supply that's surrounding the tissue, um, cartilage can take a long time to repair, if repair at all, okay? So it can, there could be minor repair, uh, but primarily it's gonna have to be repaired via arthroscopic surgery, okay? Um, if you've ever had, uh, I had damage to, so our meniscus, the knee, the, the very special uh, cartilage that makes up the knee, this would be fibrocartilage and you'll have the medial and the lateral meniscus. And when these get damaged, you know, arth arthroscopic repair is what can take place and help to uh, trim off areas that have been damaged and uh, uh, are kind of like broken away from or torn away from the original uh, menisci. Sprains and strains. A sprain is ligaments that have been overstretched and there's can be certain tearing that can take place. That would be a sprain, so ligamentous sprain. Strains are when a muscle and tendon can be overstretched and torn, okay? That's a strain, but a sprain is ligamentous. And so ligaments are holding what? Bone to bone. They're securing bone to bone, helping to keep a joint nice and tight and in place so that it doesn't have the ability to uh, luxate or subluxate, okay? And now let's talk about those terms. So, Dislocations, uh, luxation or subluxations, right? So partial or full dislocation of a, a bone out of the joint where it should be in its in its uh, in its normal uh, presentation and uh, position, um, caused by serious falls or contact sports, must be reduced to treat. So, and this can be very painful if you've ever had that done to yourself or seen it done. Folks, it just, I've never, I've never dislocated any joint in my body, um, but I can only, I've seen them uh, repositioned and quite painful. Yeah, any, anybody had any type of dislocation at all? It's not a fun, fun thing to deal with for sure. Subluxation, a partial dislocation of a joint. So when we talk about, as far as chiropractors and what we treat, as far as our primary diagnosis would be subluxations of the spine, of the joints of the spine, of the vertebra, um, they're not totally dislocating, but they're moving out of alignment and can cause impingement of the nervous system. The bursitis I talked to you about as far as an inflammation, so any type of itis is an inflammation, so an inflammatory process taking place of the bursa, okay, caused by some type of injury, caused by a blow or friction. Um, this can be uh, something that can occur over a period of time and get irritated. Um, a tendonitis. So we're thinking of tendons, right? We're thinking of tendons that are inflamed, right? As a result, and primarily it's overuse type uh, situations that can occur very similar to the bursa being irritated and inflamed. The arthritis, right? So an arthritis, so when we think of arthritis, we think of some type of uh, inflammatory process of a joint, okay? And really uh, what you think of, when you think of arthritis, you're thinking of osteoarthritis. This is the wear and tear. We can also, there's another term we can use for this here. Degenerative joint disease, okay? That's another, a, that's an AKA for osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease. Okay. This is the wear and tear arthritis. That's truly what it is. It's wear and tear. It's as a result of um, progressive um, use of the joints of your body and some as a result of genetics, as a result of lack of training, as a result of whatever it may be, uh, you know, you can, you can end up wearing out joints. And this is just uh, some people, it does, this really can happen to later in life. Some people it happens to an earlier night life. Um, if you've ever injured a joint, they're uh, subjective, subjective, subjected to uh, degenerative joint disease. So if I've injured a, uh, a knee, say I'm 12 years old and I was playing flag football and I injured my knee, well, yeah, even at 12 years old, you can end up having the beginning stages of uh, a wear and tear type of a situation, depending upon how badly you injured uh, the, the affected joint, okay? Now look at this here, by 85, half of the Americans develop Osteoarthritis, uh, osteoarthritis, wear and tear, degenerative joint disease. Now, rheumatoid arthritis, we think of as an autoimmune function, autoimmune disease, and it really is systemic. 
systemic. It's not only just attacking just the joints, but it can attack many areas of the body, including the heart. Okay? So it is a systemic type of an illness. It's an autoimmune illness where the body is attacking, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, it's attacking the actual uh, joints themselves. Okay? And so this is not good, and this can attack patients from ages 40 to 50, um, and really uh, can be very, very uncomfortable. And really, when you see uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I'm going to show you an image. And let's look here. And this will look pretty uncomfortable, to be honest. Yeah. So look at this, folks. This is this is quite sad, actually. So the the deformation that can take place with someone suffering with rheumatoid arthritis, right? That looks painful because it is. It, it truly is, folks. Um, when we're looking at a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, yeah, let's look look at this one right here. Um, this poor person, right? So indeed, that is just joints that are very swollen. And really, when you have a patient putting their hands in front of you, right? they will have a lateral deviation of their hands, a lateral deviation of their hands. Look at this is here. So we're seeing here as far as, uh, bigger, yeah. So early or rheumatoid arthritis, intermediate and late stage rheumatoid arthritis. So again, this is late stage rheumatoid arthritis. Um, look here as far as, that's just, that that that's very uncomfortable. Um, I've had patients with, you know, RA, throughout their body affecting, you know, and now it doesn't have to affect all the joints, but it can affect many of the joints. Um, I'll show you a patient with, uh, now, so understand this as far as patients with RA in their feet. So look at how this can affect what goes on with the joints and such. Um, can you imagine how difficult that is to walk? How painful that is to walk? Let me show you as far as the ankles. Yeah, so look look at this, folks. Here, so um, I had a uh, one of my patients that I can remember who was a, a dear, dear woman and uh, very giving and uh, caring in her community. So here we're looking at the, ma the medial malleolus, right, of the tibia, okay, medial malleolus. And so look at the positioning here, right? She had RA so bad in her, uh, in her lower extremity where she was actually, the medial malleolus was pretty much take, making contact with the ground. So that's how the deviation of her foot as a result of the deformation that taking place as a result of rheumatoid arthritis. Her medial malleolus was actually touching the ground as she was walking. And so that was really very painful and uncomfortable. And uh, so, you know, so your patients, depending upon uh, what's going on in their lives, you know, you'll see some pretty uh, shocking types of um, deformation as far as musculoskeletal uh, can occur. So gouty arthritis. So gout, um, you'll see this primarily uh, great toe, the, the great toe of the foot. You'll see this also in the knees. Uh, you can see it in other joints also. Um, what will happen is that as a result of um, this deposition of uric acid crystals and issues with the body processing um, proteins and such, we can end up having issues with these crystals getting stuck in the joints, okay, and causing inflammation and a lot of pain and discomfort. Okay. Alcohol can also be a trigger. Um, you know, meats, beef products can be a trigger. Um, and again, too, uh, uh, genetics plays a role in this, okay, and gouty arthritis. Lyme disease, we, we're familiar with this. We've heard this before as far as, uh, you know, as a result of tick bites and such. And this can affect uh, the musculoskeletal system as well as the neurological, the nervous system. Um, Lyme disease is a nasty, nasty illness, indeed. So skin rash, flu-like symptoms, foggy thinking, so affecting neurological as well as the joints, joint pain and arthrit arthritis. And again, as a result of a bacteria. Go. And that's it. Okay. So I'm going to stop recording.